an adult raped and murdered a young child. Like she, she was not even a woman yet. There's a lot of indigenous youth people face this sort of injustice. And we are, a lot of us go missing and face this type of violence. And the justice system does nothing. Um, our lives aren't valued. When you have non-indigenous people opening up their homes for foster and group home placements, and they're treating indigenous children like crap, because of the, the money incentives, there's something wrong there. When you have native children such as Tina Fontaine dying in foster care while she was living in a hotel, there's something wrong. There is genocide in Canada. It's a harsh reality to some, but it's the truth. As an indigenous youth and now woman, I am one of many that have been neglected by our country. The system placed me in unsafe conditions that have traumatized me since I was born in ways that should have been prevented. I was taken advantage of by someone in a position of power. I suffered further, enduring years of humiliation and anger, fighting for justice that was ultimately denied to me. I needed help. And in seeking it, I was ostracized. That nearly ruined my life before it even began. My life in Inuvik was over when I came forward as a victim in my community. After I turned 18, I moved here to the other side of the country and started a new life completely alone. Canada failed Tina long before she was murdered and we're failing the indigenous youth out there suffering as we speak. The social services system, the police force, the criminal justice system, the government, our communities, we all failed Tina. My son's in state custody. I do not say uh, my son is in care because he is not in care. He's being ignored and I've seen the progression of him falling in the cracks. He has now fallen to the point where he has an undiagnosed, um, not even a mental health uh, disorder, and he is on 20 to 80 milligrams of Seraxel. I did not have my child to be a guinea pig. Native women did not have children to be meal tickets for lawyers, psychiatrists, judges, child welfare employees, directors, executive directors, and managers. It is a huge child welfare industry going on here. And when an indigenous mother goes to court, they are silenced. I myself had to sign a crown wardship under severe emotional and physical duress by someone that was supposed to represent me. They have to get Native Child and Family Services to agree to send my son from an institution to the Tandanaga First Nations Reserve. And the Tandanaga Mohawks are more than willing to receive my son so that he gets culturally appropriate programs and services. The key to his survival so he doesn't end up a statistic is his culture. If you want to know why so many indigenous kids end up in care, so-called care, it's because they're taken away from families that cannot afford to live and keep them properly. They lack housing, they lack clean water, they lack jobs, they lack education. And you know something? It was in 1940 that they brought child welfare into indigenous lives across the country. It was decided by a group of white people, no consultation to indigenous people. Another example of trying to de-indigenize the country. We had the first blow, which was the residential school. And the second blow is the child welfare system. After the reserve system was set in place, then they started with the residential schools of taking our children away and trying to um, take the Indian out of the child, which basically meant, you know,
take away our culture. The state worked with the church to basically commit cultural genocide on our people. Indigenous children being physically and emotionally and sexually abused and facing neglect. Parents needed permission to see their kids in the summertime. If the parents had not complied somehow with the Indian commissioner, then they would withhold allowing their children to see them. When my grandfather was four years old, he was taken away from his parents one summer, and then he wasn't allowed to come back for a couple years. And so when he returned home, his parents, uh, you know, were devastated and his mother had died. The last residential school closed in 1996. The children that are buried by the residential schools need to be uncovered and the families need to be a part of the ceremonies. Break the silence! today to demand justice for Berta Cáceres, an indigenous Lenca woman that was killed by the government of Honduras two years ago because she was defending her river. Since 2009 there has been at least 500 activists, land defenders that have been murdered in Honduras. This is my painting today that I did and today we're sending a thousand postcards to Freeland, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, to demand justice for Berta Cáceres, justice for all the political prisoners in prison since November because of the electoral fraud. We have rallied almost every week in Toronto to support that, uh, that uh, genocide that's happening in Afri. And as you see, right now, women, Kurdish women, freedom fighters, they're playing a huge role in fighting ISIS in Kobani and Shangal. We are a nation without country, 15 million people in this earth without country, and we keep getting genocide left and right from Iraq, from Iran, from Syria, from Turkey, Turkey attacking civilian women, children. Uh, they are attacking villages, you know, there is no absolutely anything in the villages, they're just killing, uh, you know, innocent people. I am here with Gabriela Ontario, which is a Filipino women's organization. Canada has a program for foreign workers to work as caregivers. It's a temporary worker program. There's the Caring for Children program and there's a Caring for people with high medical needs. Um, supposedly, if they finish uh, 24 months of work um, and other requirements, they will be eligible to apply for permanent residency. But um, just recently, there was an announcement from Immigration, Refugee and Citizenship Canada that after November 29, 2019, um, caregivers will no longer be able to apply for PR. So why not allow them to stay, not treat them like disposable workers? deliver every day. They are trained professional delivering services, having the children, the youth of our future in their hands. Every day they bring skills to their workplace and they're underpaid, undervalued, they don't have benefits, they're being laid off. They deserve the right wages for taking care of people's kids. Their lives are in our hands every day. We care for them and everybody's leaving the workforce of ECEs because not enough wages. This is a campaign fighting for workers to have an adequate wage that they can survive on. The idea is that the wage, the minimum wage should be at least a, a bit above poverty line. So in Ontario that means $15. Um, and we've been pushing and pushing. The government eventually gave uh, some consultations. They still didn't give it to us. Get pushing. <laughs> and then finally they uh, announced that they would be doing $14 by January 1st, 2018. And then $15 by January 1st, 2019. Some Tim Hortons locations cut paid breaks, cut benefits to kind of make up for the wage increase. So we've been having rallies and days of action to support workers because it's incredibly hard at Tim Hortons to speak out because, yeah, you might lose your job. We're finding that a lot of universities and colleges have a lot of low-wage workers, a lot of precarious workers who are working like contract, part-time, uh, 
temporary jobs, whereas like, you know, jobs on our campuses used to be better. They were earning around $12.20 an hour. They were also facing a lot of discrimination and harassment in the workplace. This is a lot of uh, women of color, uh, a lot of people from the Caribbean, from the Philippines, and the employer was trying to divide them based on that, try to pit, you know, racial groups against each other. Some of them are uh, visibly Muslim, for example, they wear a hijab. And one worker said that she was told that she doesn't look presentable, that she should wear lipstick. So they went on strike and we had to get workers and also students on board. Students are facing the same things that these workers are facing in terms of precarity of work. And a lot of workers and students really understood each other on the basis of experiencing racism. So it was definitely a strike to, you know, get higher wages and to demand better working conditions, but to also really fight back against that discrimination. And they were able to win that. They got um, increased to 15 with also back pay for a few months, uh, so that was really exciting. Um, they got the uh, same dental and health benefits for part-time and full-time workers. So that was great because that was a first for Airmark workers in North America. It was a really big deal. And uh, you know, it just goes to show that women and women of color who are in uh, very low-paying jobs, uh, they can fight back and they can win. We are strong, we are sacred, we are life givers. And we are leading this nation, and we are leading our men, and we are going to lead them away from the violence. We're going to lead them away from the abuse. And I want to honor these women for saying, me too. And it stops here. We will call you out in every community across this land, whether you are brown, yellow, black, or white. Violence against our women stops. And we will not stand for it within our own communities and here on the streets and across every city in this country. And I'm calling out the men in our own communities. Do not stand here if you are still perpetuating violence against women. We will call you out and we will shut you down. Woo!